Hello all. Thank you for joining us on AG Hospitals live show on both Facebook and uh, YouTube. I am Dr. Srinivas Thati, uh, Senior Consultant Orthopedic Surgeon at AG Hospitals Gachibauli, Hyderabad. I specialize in doing joint replacement surgeries and also sports injuries. I invite my colleague Dr. Harshad to introduce himself. Thanks very much. I am Dr. Harshad Jawalkar. Me too. Uh, I'm a consultant at AIG Hospital. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I am a dedicated shoulder and upper limb orthopedic surgeon. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, uh, session. I hope all of you are safe and uh, I'm glad the lockdown is over. Over to you, Srinivas. Thank you, Harsha. So we thought uh, it is a very relevant topic uh, at this time when we are all locked down because of uh, coronavirus. I hope everybody is safe at home and because the lockdown is eased out as we are coming out into the uh, communities, please take care of all the precautions. We thought the return to sports after lockdown and how to prevent the injuries and uh, the treatment aspect is very useful. We want to uh, pitch it to a general uh, view rather than going into the deep down into the subject. So, um, after the, with the lockdown, most of us who are very active sports-wise or those who are doing uh, recreational activities, certainly there's a reduced level of physical activity. We call that physical inactivity. When we look at uh, how the physical inactivity affects in general, there are, when I looked at a lot of studies, the first thing I noted is the uh, statement or which is written by uh, a father of surgery who comes from our own country, India, uh, Srishpruta, who said physical inactivity has long-term effects. A sedentary lifestyle can cause issues. Um, the common things which we see are there is uh, with two weeks of reduced activity, it can affect the muscle mass. The muscle mass can go down significantly. The cardiorespiratory reserve also goes down significantly. And the fat mass increases. So this is a study which was done on 28 very healthy subjects at an average age of 25 years. Before the study, they used to perform more than 10,000 steps in a day. They were put on a reduced activity level for a couple of weeks and they were reassessed and they were looked at there was significant reduction in the muscle mass the cardiorespiratory reserve what it is is how your heart and the lungs are functioning to get the oxygen to the tissues during a normal activity and how it is changed when you're increasing your activity these are also reduced and the volume of fat is increased. So it is very important and imperative that we have to get back to activity safely once the lockdown is gone. Even during the lockdown period, I would say we have to continue activity within doors. So Srinivas, what is the difference between physical activity and physical fitness. I've heard people use these terms interchangeably many a times. Is there a difference? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Harshad. Yes, certainly there is a, a difference. When you look at the definitions, how the CDC comes up with about the physical activity, any bodily movement you do, which is making your muscle to contract, it doesn't have to be the skeletal muscle, even the cardiac muscle, it is also a muscle. We are burning calories that itself is a physical activity. When it comes to the fitness, fitness is entirely different. It is your ability to carry out your daily task with vigor and alertness. Okay? So you can do all your day-to-day -day activities and also have a reserve capacity to perform recreational activities. That's where the physical fitness is important. We have to understand the difference between the just a physical activity as well as the fitness. So fitness is 
where you have the reserve capacity to respond to unconditional or sudden surge in your activity. In persons who are inactive for a long period, that's where your physical fitness is affected. You may be physically active, that means you're only burning your energy, but to get to the fitness, you need to do a little bit more. So there are various components of physical fitness. When we look at the cardiorespiratory endurance, which is the ability, as I said before, of the heart and lungs to send the oxygen to various tissues, this is very important because based on this, only our activity level or the fitness is mainly dependent on. The skeletal muscle, the endurance, the power, strength, these are also reduced with inactivity. The other aspects of the fitness, physical fitness like flexibility, balance, the speed of movement, how is your reaction time to an event and also the body composition as I've shown before will also affect. So with a period of inactivity, all these components of physical fitness will be reduced. So it will be very important for us to get back safely to start off the activities so that all these components are improved. So we need to be very careful when we are returning to our pre-lockdown levels of fitness. Correct. I mean, in these last uh, couple of months, we've lost a lot of our physical fitness. So I think we are at a key point where we have to uh, co focus on safely getting back to our pre-fitness levels. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, how can we get back to sports uh, safely? This is very important to uh, think about. We should not go into surge of activity immediately because the lockdown is over and we are free to get into the field because this can have significant effects or injuries. So I will focus on how we can return to sports. Always better to start with moderate activity which you are able to perform and gradually increase to the intent, increase the intensity. What I mean with the moderate activity is uh, taking a few minutes less than what you are used to. Instead of working out half an hour, you can start off with 10 minutes and see how you are getting on. You work on how to improve your balance. Balance is very important, particularly when it comes to the trunk as well as the uh, low limbs. If your trunk balance is not good, that means the core balance, your chance of having injuries will be high. So you have to make sure that your core balance is got back to normal. Gradually resume your resistance training. Sudden increase in resistance training can cause uh, various injuries, not only to the muscles, ligaments, joints, also bones can be affected. You always recommend you need to take a break, particularly when you are starting your activities or a period of inactivity. When you look at the studies, the best is to give a break for two days. Now, once you are in a lockdown for a long period and you have the freedom to go out, two days is too long. So you would like to get back to regular activity. I would urge to say at least you have to take a day break, if not two days, and then gradually increase your activity level. That becomes very important to prevent the injuries. If you think how long does it take for me to get back to my pre inactivity level to the active level, a lot of studies show that it can take around four to six weeks. It is not only your general activity or fitness, it is also the cardiorespiratory reserve. The cardiac muscle has to get used to it. To get back to that level of physical activity which you were before, it takes around four to six weeks. So please spend that time before you get back to your physical activity. The other important thing is uh, once you start doing the exercises, um, good warm-up is very important. I see a lot of patients who come up with these injuries because of the lack of warm-up. So I spend at least 10 to 15 minutes in doing warm-up. Harshit, can you tell me how, what are things you do to warm-up yourself when you're oh. starting your exercise? Okay, so it, uh, well, basically I need to be patient. I can't just jump into the exercise routine right away. Yeah. So I take a little bit of time off. I make sure that I am warm enough. My cardiac uh, function should be slowly brought up. So in the warm-up, I start off with a light jog. 
maybe around five minutes. It doesn't have to be very exhausting, but just to get the leg muscles moving. And then all the muscles, all the key muscles, they need to be stretched out. So for me, if I'm doing my upper body exercises, then they would involve stretching of my shoulder muscles, my chest muscles, the upper back, uh, all the muscles of the rotator cuff, and then elbows and wrists sequentially. So uh, the way I do it is, I hold a particular stretch for about five deep breaths, and then I release that stretch and move on to the next group of muscles. Similarly, if it's for the lower limb, for, for days in which I'm doing my lower limb workouts or I'm running, then I make sure that my lower back, the glutes, the thigh muscles, the hip muscles, the knees, all of them are nice and loose by stretching before I actually start the workout. There's a myth about uh, the stretching, okay. There are two types of stretches as we understand, dynamic stretching and static stretching. So dynamic stretching is useful in the warm-up as you said, okay, but static stretching can sometimes can weaken the muscle. So uh, it is very important to understand that do the static stretching after your activity, do the dynamic stretching before the activity. That makes a big difference in the muscle strength and power. Do you agree with that? Yeah, agreed. Fantastic. That's another point that you touched upon. Stretching is important not only before the exercise, but in fact it is more important after you're done with your workout. So post-workout stretching is even more important to prevent any sort of sports injuries. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, how to know if you are doing an optimal exercise? That is one of the common questions I have been asked. Correct. So for my current status of physical activity level or the fitness, how do I know if I am doing an optimal exercise? Somebody who has been inactive for some time and when you are starting your activity, it is uh, very important to do a simple test called talk test. If you are able to talk in sentences when you are exercising, your activity level is moderate. It applies to everybody. If you are not able to talk even words, then your intensity has gone high. So if you have started off your activities after a while, it is important that you can assess with this simple test, whether you are able to do a moderate activity or a high intense activity. So if you are getting too breathless, so take time off, take a little bit back and then start off again. That will help in preventing further issues. This point was very important Srinivas. So don't just jump into your pre-lockdown level of uh, workout, take it easy and then start off with moderate intensity. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Right. So, so how to prevent injuries? What are the general guidelines that you can uh, tell us how to prevent any sort of sports injuries when you're working out, whether you're a professional athlete or whether you're an amateur or a weekend warrior who just plays once or twice a week? I mean, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, sportsmen, before they get to an actual game, every sportsman goes into a training session so that they can come to the physical fitness level which allows them to go and give their best in the field. So that helps not only in improving your performance, it also helps in preventing the injuries. A face return is very important. That's why we take breaks in between when you start your activity after the lockdown. So you start off with a, a moderate activity, give a break of a day or two and then get back slowly increasing your time or duration of activity and the intensity of activity. That certainly will stretch out your muscles, they will make them supple and stronger. That's where the warm ups and stretching is very important. The other general measures you have to take, these are very important because these can also cause problems in the long term. Like maintaining the hydration, especially the summer time. Mm -hmm. So uh, don't jump into the activity in this hot sun. So make sure that you are adequately hydrated and uh, taking not just water. It is very important to have the electrolytes in some. So keep using ORS, a simple form is the ORS. Use the ORS so that your electrolytes which are losing in the sweat are taken back in so that the body homeostasis is well maintained. 
also use the protective equipment, especially when you're doing uh, contact sports and non-contact sports, either of them, better to use the protective equipment. Like I do a lot of cycling, I always make sure that I use the helmet, I use my wrist protectors. That is very important so that you don't have a, you won't, won't be in a position where you need to get this treated. So it's very important. There's a good saying, prevention is better than cure. So always take these precautions to prevent. The other, other problem which we can see is uh, overuse. Mm -hmm. Especially in amateur sportsmen, we see that. They tend to uh, go for a big goal. That certainly can affect the muscles or the ligaments in a big way. So it's try to avoid overuse. Overuse can have long-standing effects on your muscles and ligaments. Yeah. So these are the things I would say will certainly help in preventing injuries. Can I add one more point to your Srinivas? Please, so ahead. when Srinivas says protective gear or equipment, does that include shoes as well? I guess shoes are really, really, really important for uh, a lot of exercising guys. I mean, whether it is running, whether it is any sort of sports, shoes are probably the most important piece of equipment you could invest in. Can't agree more. And uh, finding the appropriate shoes, because every sport has its own uh, uh, way of uh, leverage when you're walking or bouncing on the floor. Uh, so it is very important to find the appropriate shoe. The running shoes are different from the shoes which you're going to wear for your racket sports. It gets a bit clumsy because you feel like, do I have to use all of these? Correct. Too many pairs. But I think it is very important to do that so that you can prevent long-term injuries. And I completely agree. Yes, you need to have a separate shoes for each activity. And we also see sometimes we are using the same shoe for a long period even when they are worn out. So please keep changing the shoes. Check how your shoes were before the lockdown. <laughs> I know the shops are closed, but yes, it is also important to make sure the shoes are appropriate before you get back to your sports. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to the next question now. So what are the common sports injuries that we as orthopedic surgeons see in routine practice? In general speaking, we can uh, break it down tissue-wise. Okay. The commonest injuries we see is the muscle tears. The second commonest is the ligament tears. In some patients we can see tendon injuries and also uh, bone or bone injury or fracture dislocations. Sorry. So when you look at the muscle tears, why does the muscles uh, tear or strain uh, when you start back your activity after a period of a break? Majority of times it is because of the tightness of the tissues. When you're not doing the activity, the stretching of the muscle is not adequate. Once you jump in to start your activities, particularly like racket sports, badminton or tennis, or even running for the distance, you're, what you're doing is you're stretching the muscle significantly. When the muscle is tightened and short, when you're putting the force which is needed to get you through the activity, that can cause micro trace. Sometimes the micro trace can become macro tears which can cause pain. When you think about the activity, any physical activity you do or exercise after a period of break, we always get a lot of pains or aches in the muscles. This is mainly because of the micro tears in the muscles. Fortunately, they heal by themselves. But when it comes to macro tear or a bigger tear in the muscle, it takes long term to heal. They can form scarring. That can also affect the muscle function in the long term. Similarly, tendon injuries. Uh, uh, Srinivas, can I interrupt? Sorry. Just for the uh, for our audience, can you just tell what micro tear is and what a macro tear is? Because I think it's a bit too technical. Okay, sure. Um, micro tear is like I said before, when you have done some exercising and you feel aches rather than a real pain or swelling or any change in the color in the tissues. That goes in the form of micro tear, which you can identify only under a microscope. Ah, okay. okay. When it comes to a macro tear or a bigger tear, with your own eyes, you can see how the tear is. The macro tear will be uh, more localized than a micro tear. Micro tear, you'll have a generalized ache, 
when it comes to macro tear the tear of the muscle will give pain in that particular muscle that particular area it gets more painful when you start activating that muscle that is how you can differentiate the micro tear will be generalized when it comes to a bigger tear in the muscle specific muscle that will be localized and affects the function significantly right right so micro tears i suppose are uh, relatively more common after any workout but Absolutely. micro tears you should be really really be worried about Absolutely. micro tears settle down on their own correct but macros you need medical attention for that okay let's move on to the next question uh, next uh, uh, tissue ligaments please so um, i think we'll go with the ligaments uh, specific to the joint that way it will be easy to understand than generalizing because the treatment coming to the ligaments and the tendons is a little bit different compared to general muscle tears sure so um, you can go back to the next one, next question sure uh, so what are the common muscle injuries in the lower limbs and following up on that how do you prevent them and uh, if they happen how do you treat them thanks that's a very good important question because the commonest injuries we see especially after a period of inactivity is the muscle injuries in the lower limbs the common muscles which we see which gets uh, affected particularly are uh, calf calf muscle there are two big muscles in the calf calf gastrocnemius and soleus these can be torn easily especially when you haven't done adequate warm up so to prevent this injury yes you have to do good warm up and good stretching dynamic stretching is very important for this and post activity also you have to do the stretching of these muscles there's various different methods of doing the calf stretching which uh, are a little bit beyond our talk today but you have to focus on doing the calf stretching similarly hamstrings uh, particularly the back of the thigh can be affected the muscle tear in the hamstring can create a kind of cramp in the muscle as well um, this can affect the way you are running the running can be significantly affected you can also see these muscle tears in the racket sports groin tears particularly the inner thigh muscles are proximally are affected and we do see them in majority of the patient i mean people who are playing racket sports so when you are doing racket sports it's very important to get a good warm up do your dynamic stretching before you start your activity and gently get into the sport than jumping in straight away it may be sometimes you have to resist your uh, urge to hit a longer shot you got to take your stretch a bit less especially when you started the game back after inactivity once you are used to it then you are okay to get back onto that so very important to take it gently when it comes to the treatment um this is a very generalized thing which can be used for a muscle injury or a ligament injury or any injuries so first thing is protect if you have an injury try to not cause further injury to that we sometimes uh, overlook and play beyond even though your uh, muscle or ligament is hurting better to stop and then protect it so that you won't make it worse if you are making it worse you may need a longer period of inactivity for the healing of the muscle rest helps in getting back the tissues healing well the tissues will heal better when you take rest ice is very important it is not only painkiller it will also reduce the swelling for the swelling uh, there is a common confusion shall i use ice or a hot pack it is always better to use high ice in acute injuries because it will reduce the inflammation by reducing the inflammation it will reduce the swelling as well as the pain compression like you can apply a simple uh, crepe bandage around the area where it is injured or cold compress simply that can help around the joint like in the elbow or the knee or ankle you can use a binder which will limit the movement and the other important aspect of the general measure you can take is elevate the leg as much as you can most of the times if you have a lower limb injury keep the leg up to a level where it is above your heart level 
so that the gravity helps in reducing the swelling and continue to gently move the ankles and the toes so that the swelling doesn't accumulate in any of these areas. So these are the general measures. Majority of the muscle tears can be treated by self-care when you follow these things. You may need a week or two before you feel like the tear is healed and then you can gradually get back to the sport. Don't be surprised when you see this kind of uh, injury. This is a patient who has a rupture of the upper limb tendon, pectoralis, pectoralis where it can yeah, bleed and cause a significant bruising. We do see this kind of bruising in the lower limbs as well. Yeah. When you see such thing and you're able to move your joint without any deformity, then you think it is a muscular tendon tear, not a fracture or dislocation. Of course, it needs a good examination. Yes, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Srinivas, but uh, I've seen lots of these injuries when I was in London. So this is almost a typical patient profile, uh, a bodybuilder who likes to work out, lifts a lot of weights, and then suddenly he has a lot of pain and bruising around the shoulder, and it's usually the pectoralis major tendon which gives way. And uh, it's, it's easy to be very, very alarmed when you see such a picture. Correct. So your chance of having such an injury is more likely when you start off activity quickly without gradually getting into the activity. So uh, you've got to be careful when you start off after inactivity. So I, uh, next question I'd like to ask you, uh, what are the common tendon injuries in the lower limbs? So I want you to get into a little bit more detail rather than the general principles that you talked about last time. And again, followed up by how to prevent them and how to treat them. Sure. See, um, when you uh, look at the common injuries to the tendon, the heel cord or the tendon behind your heel bone called Achilles tendon is very commonly injured. This happens because of uh, wear and tear over a period of time. We commonly see this in the age group between 40 to 60 years. And... Uh, often see in racket sports or when you're running or when you miss this step when you're running on uneven ground. These are the common modalities where you feel that, uh, where you see this injury. Often patients will say, I felt a big pop as if somebody knocked me behind the back of my heel. If that kind of a um, feel you have at the time of injury or when you have enough significant pain, you always need to suspect the Achilles tendon tear. When it comes to prevention, again, the general principles go back. Go back to the general principles. How to prevent these kind of injury. Getting gently into your activity, doing proper warm-up, and gradually doing dynamic stretches, and then slowly ramping up your uh, speed in performing the activity. And at the end of the activity, continue with the stretches. This, is, this will prevent the tan on tear often. When it comes to the treatment, Majority of the tendo eclis tears or the heel cord tears can be treated non-operatively. We can give like a cast where the foot is put in a equinus where it allows the tissue to heal up together. If the patient would like to be more functional, nowadays we are using walker walking boot where the foot is still kept in equinus and gradually will get the foot back to a better position and in some group of patients or in patients whom the non-operative treatment failed we may need to do surgery. When it comes to non-operative treatment it can take around uh, 6 to 12 weeks before you can get back to sports. It doesn't change even when I operate so there's not much difference when it comes to treating non-operatively in a cast or a boot or when you're doing operation. So Tender Achilles tears, as you can treat non-operatively or operatively. Majority of the times, we follow non-operative treatment. The other common injury I said is around the knee, the patellar tendon or the quadriceps tendon. When you look at the knee joint, the kneecap has a big tendon which is formed from the muscle on the front of the thigh. This happens in deceleration injuries like if you are doing a fast run and suddenly you stop, the force going to the muscle can pull off the tendon which is attached to the bone. Similarly, 
it can happen on the other side of the tendon, other side of the bone, which is the patellar tendon. In both the scenarios, the treatment would be doing surgery because non-operative treatment in these uh, injuries have shown really bad results. So patients will feel a lot of pain around the knee. They'll have significant swelling. They feel that the knee is very unstable and will not be able to straighten the leg. These are the symptoms which you can see in case of a quadriceps tendon tear or a patellar tendon tear. Quadriceps tendon tears are common in the elderly. When it comes to patellar tendon, you see it in more of a younger age group. So whichever age group, the treatment remains more surgical where we have to do surgery. Yeah, uh, uh, keep going Srinivas, uh, uh, the information you sp you're providing is very, very useful. So let's come back to our ligament injuries of the lower limbs. So can you tell us more about the ligament injuries? The most commonly in ligaments injured are around the ankle joint. Again, this will happen when uh, your balance is not right. So it is very important for the lower limb balance to be corrected before you get back to your sports. The balancing not only the low limbs, you and your trunk control should be good. That's where your prehab, that means uh, doing exercises before you start getting into the sport is very important. So in the prehab, try to get your core muscle strengthened and get your limb balance and coordination corrected. The majority of the times around the ankle, what we see is the ligament on the outer side of the ankle which is called ATFL. There are different grades of this ligament tear as well. It can be just a stretch or a partial tear or a full tear. But the good thing about the ankle ligament tears is majority of them can be treated non-operatively. We can give a boot or a ankle binder and the rest of the general measures, the price which was told before, like protecting, rise, resting, ice, compression, and elevation. All these are very important. Sometimes patients come back and ask how long does it take for this ligament tear to heal. Again, it depends upon the severity. If it is a simple sprain, it can take a couple of weeks to heal. A partial tear can take around three to four weeks. And if it is a complete tear, it can take longer, up to six to twelve weeks. When it comes to the knee joint, there are several ligaments around the knee. The ligaments on the outer side which provide the stability in terms of knee going outside and inside. These are collateral ligaments and there are two insides deep in the joint called cruciate ligaments. They provide the stability in uh, torsion particularly and also forward and backward movement. When it comes to the knee ligaments, the most common ligament injury we see is the medial collateral ligament. This ligament is on the inner side. Again, the grading is similar. You can say it is a, a partial tear or a complete tear. If there is a complete tear, certainly the treatment will be repaired. In a partial tear, majority of the times, you have to, you can treat that in uh, uh, splints, like a range of movement brace, which need to be used for three to six weeks. The patient can bend the knee as much as they can and they can fully weight bear with the help of crutches. The other ligament which we commonly see injured is the ACL. ACL is a important stabilizer particularly in the torsional movements. The ligament gets injured in cutting movements. We often see this in non-contact sports more than contact sports. The patients can feel a pop at the time of the injury. The knee swells up immediately. They'll have difficulty in weight bearing and they may not be able to carry on the sport if they have injured this. They have to get back to a physician to get this checked to identify. But before that, the general measures they can start off with uh, the price. And then we can reassess how the stability is when it comes to the treatment part, not every ACL tear needs a reconstruction. We have to carefully look at the patient profile. Is the patient a, a sportsman? 
is the patient a recreational sportsman or is only a desk, he's a desk job personality so what is the age group of the patient how unstable is the knee joint all this need to be factored in before we can say what would be the treatment there's a simple rule of noise where we say one third of the patients who have ACL tear can be treated non-operatively one third can try non-operative treatment or change the modify the activities and doesn't need a surgery but one third of the patients will need surgery to reconstruct particularly those who are young very active in sports and even patients who are on the higher BMI side all these need a stable knee so the other common injury we see is the meniscus in the knee joint meniscus is a disc in the knee we have one on the inner side one on the outer side the inner side is called medial meniscus when there's a tear of the medial meniscus again we have to look at the symptoms depending on the symptoms how it is affecting the activities then we cater what kind of treatment we do and uh, very uncommon is multi ligament injuries fractures and dislocations around the knee if there is a multi ligament injury majority of the time it is involved associated with a subluxation or dislocation these definitely need a operative treatment and you have to get back to the surgeon a, a sports specialist I hope that is the I covered most of the common lower limb injuries yes. now we can get into what are the common injuries we'll ask our expert Dr. Harshad what are the common upper limb injuries how we can prevent and treat uh, thank you Srinivas so there are a lot of injuries uh, common around the shoulder and the upper limb uh, the, uh, I'd like to state that most of the general principles of treatment have already been covered by you uh, I'd also like to say that the treatment of most of these injuries is usually conservative that means it does not need an operation it needs rest and along with that good rehabilitation and uh, only the very few injuries which are severe which incapacitate the athlete only they need operative intervention so the common injuries around the shoulder are the rotator cuff so the rotator cuff is a group of muscles which actually cover the ball and socket joint of the shoulder they actually hold the ball of the shoulder and pull it into the socket so they are commonly injured I see quite a lot of shoulder dislocations in in my routine practice as well I mean they can be first time dislocators or they can be uh, habitual repeated dislocations which can occur the treatment differs slightly but most of them they get better uh, dislocation of the joint between the collarbone and the shoulder blade this is the joint at the top of the shoulder even those injuries are pretty common in th these are more common in uh, contact sports fortunately they are not so common in India but they are seen in accidents quite a bit and fractures of the collarbone are very common but fortunately again like I said most of them they get better with a period of rest and without any surgery uh, there are a few more injuries uh, there is a labrum tear labrum is a ring of cartilage which deepens the socket of the shoulder joint these are commonly injured in any athlete who does a lot of uh, overhead activity or uh, if they are racket sport players uh, especially in bowlers of cricket tennis players badminton players labral injuries are pretty common is there any uh, difference in age group among all the injuries these are very common in uh, young sporty guys rotator cuff tears are common in slightly more elderly so middle-aged and above people they tend to have rotator cuff tears more often and the younger people they tend to have shoulder dislocations and uh, collarbone fractures uh, more common it's it's basically it depends on the strength of the tissues okay. when it comes to the how do you prevent these especially the upper limb injuries oh uh, you you covered most of them so you asked so the treatment uh, sorry the prevention principles are uh, the same as as you mentioned I'd like to add a few more I mean these are subtle but important things which we need to follow 
uh, the usual protection, rest, ice and compression along with elevation of the injured part needs to be done and uh, usually you need to seek medical attention if uh, the pain and uh, disability does not settle down in uh, a few days. Most of the injuries they require uh, rehabilitation some of them like I mentioned may need surgery followed by intense period of rehabilitation stretching is key to prevent the surgeries not just before but after uh, I'd also like to add a few more things know the rules of the game that you're playing know the proper form and technique which you're playing for example in tennis there are a lot of grips which we can hold it continental is one and there are different types of grips that you can use it also makes a difference whether you are using a single handed backhand or a double handed backhand mm -hmm. how your uh, shoulder circumducts when you are going for your serve so all these techniques are also key to prevent shoulder injuries so make sure you have a coach you follow the techniques properly and uh, follow the rules of the game as well um, obviously I don't have to get into that but rules are there to ensure that the game yeah. stays a game and does not result in any injuries and you need to be patient you need to have the mental makeup to know when to relax when to give rest and when to actually continue with playing uh, I know I played a lot of sports when I was younger I played a lot of basketball in college and the temptation to get back on the court with a sprained ankle or a nagging wrist pain is too much so you need to have the patience to control that urge uh, uh, hopefully that answers your question, Srinivas. Absolutely, absolutely. So, what is the treatment of the rotator cuff tears if there is somebody who has a cuff tear following a sports injury? Right, so uh, like I already said, rotator cuff tears uh, are, uh, are very, very common. They are probably one of the commonest sport injury, sporting injury which we see in the shoulders. Uh, not all injuries of the rotator cuff end up in tears. Fortunately, again, most of them, they are just sprains, strains or uh, even partial tears in which there is only partial tearing of the cuff of muscles which surround the ball and socket joint. So in these cases, we need, uh, uh, one more thing I'd like to add in all these sport injuries is that x-rays usually are normal. So it's very easy for lay person uh, to say that, oh, I got an x-ray done. It's easy to uh, share the x-ray with your uh, known people or uh, doctors who you're friends with. And then uh, you say that the x-ray is normal, but why am I still having the pain? Uh, one thing I'd like to add is most of these injuries, most of these soft tissue injuries, they need a detailed clinical evaluation followed by further imaging of the soft tissues. Most commonly, uh, we use MRI scans, but uh, in certain cases, for example, in rotator cuff tears, ultrasound is also shown to be very, very useful. Of course, there are some caveats there. It has I think to be we'll, let's not get too technical on that. Okay. Um, we can so, have a separate talk on how we can assess them. Let's go a bit general because we're getting too many questions here. All right, we need all to right. answer a lot of questions. We have flooded with a lot of questions here. Sure. So, um, what we'll do is let us finish off your general consensus and then we'll get back to the questions All so right. that we have a pattern on that. I hope the viewers will agree with that. <laughs> Thanks for that. Sure, sure. All right. So, I'm, I'm excited that we're getting a lot of questions already. Okay, so rotator cuff tears, uh, if it is a frank tear in a young athlete, they need surgical repair. And uh, it usually entails some time off, usually about three months before they can get back to their activities. The next uh, common injury that I see around the shoulder is a shoulder dislocation. I'm sure you know a lot of people who have uh, shoulder dislocations. So the treatment principles are broadly that first time dislocators, that is the first time the shoulder dislocates, uh, it is usually non-operative treatment. That means with a period of time off from the game and uh, this is after the, the dislocation is reduced. Uh, usually a time, period of time off ranging from a few weeks, uh, one week to about three weeks. With rehabilitation, they can go back to the sports. But uh, unfortunately, 
in the younger the patient and the more severe the injury it tends to be uh, a repeated dislocation so it can get into recurrent dislocations so whenever the shoulder starts to dislocate more often that time you need to uh, repair it so unfortunately that is the time uh, they need to take a lot of time off and then they need surgery uh, to repair the damage done and then uh, could you go to the next slide please yeah so this is what uh, it looks like on the mri and the on the image on the right is done after surgery so usually with surgical treatment again it has to be followed by a lot of physiotherapy to get this movement and the strength back and uh, in the majority of the patients keyhole surgery is successful but occasionally we need to do a bigger procedure an open procedure in which a uh, bone block is applied okay yeah. that's, that's great mm -hmm. so certainly it's very important to prevent uh, recurrence so Absolutely. you have to take a call early on so that you can you won't get into the recurrence of a dislocation absolutely it makes a big difference right yeah the, num yeah. the more number of dislocations you have uh, the harder it is for me to operate and then for you to get back to your original shape as well another common injury is dislocation of the acromioclavicular joint don't get scared so it is the joint at the top of the shoulder between the collarbone on the front and uh, the uh, shoulder blade so it is very common in contact sports it is very common in uh, 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 road traffic accidents and uh, fortunately as it is in the pattern of all the other injuries most of them they do not need any surgery they get better with rest and lots of rehabilitation for a few weeks but occasionally the injury is very severe the collarbone has moved out of its location quite a lot and that time it needs to be brought back and then kept in its place with surgery this usually needs a few weeks to months of time off from the sport but the results are usually pretty good and uh, this is again a collarbone already fractures. i think we spoke about the collarbone fractures so we'll move yeah. to the next one yeah. so what is this labral tears uh, so labrum uh, like i said before it's a ring of cartilage which deepens the socket of the shoulder joint it also gives it a lot of stability so especially in overhead activity uh, involving racket sports or in bowling the muscle pull along with the movements which are there it causes a lot of stress on the ring of cartilage and uh, it can tear um, it often presents with vague dull aching pain around the shoulder and it's particularly aggravated when uh, in in certain positions of the shoulder and uh, there is a lot of controversy about the treatment but uh, the it's uh, the general principles are that the uh, the minor degrees of tears they usually get better with without surgery but the more severe ones they need arthroscopic surgery that means keyhole surgery to repair the tear uh, uh, there are lots of ligaments around the shoulder as well which actually we have a question on this uh, shoulder ligament uh, what is the therapy for costoclavicular ligament injury costoclavicular ligament injury is uh, uh do you mean costoclavicular or coracoclavicular uh costoclavicular okay that's a very specific question correct <laughs> uh, so generally speaking corac uh, coracoclavicular injuries are a lot more common than costoclavicular injuries uh, costoclavicular ligament is the one which holds the rib cage to the collarbone and usually it does not cause any problems as long as the other ligaments are doing the job if the shoulder blade is being held to the clavicle to the collarbone and that joint is intact and the collarbone is in place if it hasn't moved much then it does not need any surgery the treatment is uh, non operative with uh, the price protocol yeah rest right. and ice i think that should do right for cost clavicle very unusual injury to have exactly so. it's not a very common injury at all uh so ligaments around the shoulder there are plenty of ligaments uh, which can get injured uh, i'll not get into the depth of this because these are slightly more unusual but uh, if uh, the the treatment principles are the same if you are severely disabled then uh, you need surgery but otherwise most of them settle down with 
lots of conservative treatment and rehab. Uh, another particular condition which is very very common in the upper limb is uh, what is known as tennis elbow. Uh, so in this condition there is micro trauma that means that if there is a, an activity which causes repeated force, repeated pressure on the tendons of the upper limb that means uh, there is usually it, it, it is traditionally known to be common in tennis players when they use a single handed backhand but uh, it can often occur without any specific reason it's very common in uh, housewives it is very common in yeah, I think we have seen more of well. uh, non sportsmen with tennis elbow than, than sportsmen, sportsmen but certainly when the sportsmen get back to activity after a period of break uh, um, inactivity certainly we can see a surge in these injuries tennis right? elbows yes i mean sachin tendulkar had it yes. and he's better already uh, so uh, the treatment is uh, general price treatment followed by rest very very rarely less than i'd say 5% of the patients have uh, an injury which does not respond to these conservative measures and they will need some sort of intervention whether it is a steroid injection into the into those inflamed muscles and the tendons around the elbow or uh, very rarely even even lesser percent maybe around 1 to 2% of the population who have this condition need surgery to get rid of this condition now i think i've broadly covered the principles of uh, upper limb uh, uh, injury sporting injuries fantastic so, so i'll we'll go through the questions uh, which have we are flooded with a lot of questions the first question uh, what type of kneecap you suggest for badminton on a wooden court so open or closed patella that's a very interesting question and important question we have seen a lot of patient i mean a lot of sportsmen who wear the kneecaps it's a common confusion what kind of a support we need to take it depends on how your knee joint is beforehand if the knee joint has any patellofibral instability you want to keep the patella moving in the groove of the thigh bone the thigh bone has a groove like this and you want the patella to move in the right in the center so that the force is going equally on the, both the sides if your patella is tilted to one side it's better to have something with a open patella which keeps it in place so for somebody who has abnormal tracking of the kneecap or the patella you can use a open cap which contains the patella in a certain position if you do not have that if you are using for stability to limit the movement or excursion then you can use the closed patella is that clear yeah, yeah. so um, the another question uh, we already answered this uh, costoclavicular ligament injury uh, can you please explain what is static stretching oh this is this is right up your alley yeah. so again static stretching uh, see uh, dynamic and static stretching stretching is a muscle every muscle has a particular length and after a period of inactivity the muscle length comes down that's where you get into stiffness that's why you feel the stiffness the static stretching is where the muscle which is being tight is stretched with the joint and bow and below not moving much a gentle pull on the muscle like a runner stretch when you're doing a runner stretch that is a static stretch when you're doing a hamstring stretch where you keep your feet on the uh, uh, table or anything on a height appropriate height that becomes a static stretch because the joint above and below the muscle which is which it is acting is stable when it comes to dynamic stretch you are losing that static place and you are moving the joint both the joints above and below to stretch the tissues for example if you are stretching a gluteal muscle when you are doing a activity very quickly that goes into a dynamic mode like running and uh, running on a spot where you are taking your knees quite high up that will stretch out your hamstrings as well as glutes that becomes a dynamic stretch so yes it's important to understand when to use the dynamic stretch and when to use the static stretch the dynamic stretch is better done as a part of the warm up when you're doing a static stretch do it at the end of your activity that will prevent any further injuries 
the next question is uh, how can we avoid the tears and sprains and what do you suggest oh we've we've covered this we so are, i think we yes uh, we have already covered this yeah. why don't you repeat that once again yeah of course so uh, uh, take it easy go slow don't just jump into what you were doing two months ago so start off gently test yourself with moderate intensity workouts and then slowly progress to severe intensity uh, you need to uh, you need to make sure that you're comfortable when you're doing the exercise stretching before and after which is key the exercise your workout session is absolutely the key wear the right gear whether it is shoes whether it is knee caps pads helmets those are key and uh, listen to your body your body will tell you when it is hurting when it needs rest if it's hurting give it minimum one or two days of rest if it feels better you can slowly start increasing your workout but if it does not you can give it rest for maybe a couple of weeks as well yeah so that's a great answer i mean i can add a few more things to that the other important thing is the preconditioning uh, it's very important to precondition your muscles after a period of inactivity so you have to gradually strengthen them up to a certain level and uh, strengthening you can do some resistance exercises or do endurance activities the second one is balance i already we already spoke about the balance Absolutely. you need to have a good trunk that is the core balance as well as balance in your lower limb muscle groups if the group of muscles the one which are working to straighten your knee or the one which is bending your knee they are out of balance then one is doing a bit more work that can result in the tears or the sprains so you have to make sure that the balance between these two group groups of muscles are good and i would like to add that uh, it's better to have a trainer absolutely to see uh, how your how your muscle groups are in the past like when we had didn't have much of training institutes um, yes it used to be our own pt teachers we used to go to the uh, friends and colleagues and all that but now every nook and corner of the place we have a training center and it will be absolutely useful to go to the trainer and assess yourself either it can be a fitness trainer or a physical therapist even the physical therapist comes in has a big role to play in this they can help you out in developing good core muscle balance getting the balance between different muscle groups and how you get your joint sense we call it as proprioception a good proprioception is very important to prevent injuries to the ligaments and the muscles so there are various different types of exercises you can do to develop all these so i think we are at flooded with questions so we can speak to a trainer or a physical therapist or you can come to us we can explain a bit more yeah we have a great uh, team of physiotherapists here Absolutely. at aig yes so the next question is um Achilles tendon rupture what are the risks of surgery looks like it's a question to me again so as is discussed in during my uh, talk the Achilles tendon ruptures you can treat in non operatively in a plaster or a walking boot or operatively i'll answer your question what are the complications of Achilles rupture uh, surgery the risk of uh, infection as with any other surgery but the common uh, complication we see is a uh, re-rupture there is small chance of re-rupture the stiffness of the ankle skin necrosis skin necrosis wound necrosis majority of the complications of Achilles rupture are around the healing of the wound once the healing of the wound is good the rupture rate is quite less is less than 5% in fact re-rupture rate mm -hmm. but it's very important to go through a rehab period if you haven't done your rehab good after a Achilles repair your risk of re-rupture is high I hope that answers your question can I add a couple of more points to that go ahead uh, so the important thing is if you are an athlete if you are a young athlete and you want to go back to your sports quickly then you should consider surgery uh, slightly more than if you are a middle-aged gentleman who's just playing for hobbies 
And having said that, the rate of complications is, although the, the list is long, the rate of complication is quite low. It's around 5 to 10 percent, maybe less. Absolutely. Yeah. Correct. And uh, one more thing to bear in mind is that the return to sport, the time of rest you will need to get back to your rehab will not be affected whether you go by a walking boot or whether you go for surgery. Is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are good randomized studies done in research when you look at um, the ACL treatments. I think we can um, discuss that at a later stage, yeah. but the risks of surgery with ACL, if you have taken good wound care and if the wound heals well, the other risks are very uncommon. But it is very important to have a good rehab after the surgery. Don't let this list of complications scare you away from surgery if you if you need it, if you genuinely need it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so the next question is, how should we treat a common sports injury immediately after it happens? It's a very good question. Oh, so uh, I'm sure he's already gotten the answer uh, from our talk. Uh, the take home message is there. And just let me repeat simple things like uh, protection of the part with some splint or with a kneecap or elbow support along with rest which is key. Icing the part uh, you can use, you don't have to have a proper ice pack, you can whatever at home you can uh, keep uh, ice cubes in a plastic packet at home and then you can do intermittent icing of the affected part. Uh, it doesn't have any side effects, uh, maybe you can do it as many times as needed, maybe two times to five times per day and then as long as you are comfortable with it, it should not cause any blisters on the skin and those, those sort of things and uh, this is more uh, appropriate in the extremities uh, which is elevation of the part. So for example, if you have a wrist injury or a knee injury or an ankle injury, it gets difficult with the lower limb injuries but the upper limb injuries to reduce the swelling and the inflammation, we ask them to elevate it. The general principle is that it should be above the level of your heart. So if you are having a twisted ankle and you should be lying down, prop your leg up on a couple of pillows. If you are sitting up, prop it up on a stool. If your wrist or elbow is injured, you might need some support as an arm sling pouch which is commercially available in all pharmacies. Uh, so these things generally take care of the majority of the injuries but if you're still in pain, if you're still not able to go back to your workout, come see a specialist. So good answers. I would like to add a couple more things. Uh, assessment of the injury is very important immediately after you had an injury. If the body part, it can be upper limb or lower limb, if it looks very much deformed, oh. try to get it back into it position where it is stable, comfortable. If the Try not to force it to get to it to a comfortable position. Better to leave it in that position and protect the limb, the splint the limb. Then you can do the rest of the things. But if you have a deformity, that means it's a significant injury. Absolutely. I mean, that is very important to understand and you need a immediate medical attention. Please take the person to the closest available healthcare facility. Absolutely. Everything I said was about minor sports minor injuries. Sports. If it is fracture or a dislocation, Correct. seek attention immediately. Like senior Absolutely. Um, this is another good question. How do we know if someone torn his ACL? Um, we have already discussed about this. I will repeat that again for the benefit of the viewers. ACL injury is common in non-contact sports or certainly when there is a sudden change in the uh, line of movement, a cutting movement happening when you're walking fast briskly and suddenly you have to turn, the knee can go into a different position we call as a valgus position and that's when the knee ACL tears. Majority of the patients will say they heard a pop in the knee joint. They hear a clicking sound in the knee joint. Along with that you develop immediately swelling. The difference between a MCL tear or a meniscal tear with the ACL tear, the meniscal tears usually swell up gradually over a period of time. But the, with the ACL tear, your joint swells up immediately and you will not be able to wait there. It is very unlikely that a patient who had an ACL tear can continue with the sport. They often come off the field. But those who have a meniscal tear or a low-grade medial meniscal tear, medial uh, collateral ligament tear, 
they can still continue with the activity and once you know that the knee is swelling up gradually then you need to definitely see a uh, sports surgeon i hope that answers your question and there's a question for you uh, what we should do to handle tennis elbow oh that's an easy one um, so initially uh, give it rest this involves trying to identify uh, trying to identify a specific activity which actually worsens the pain uh, usually racket sports it's pretty easy but uh, in in routine household activities it could be something as silly as lifting a bucket of water or in uh, or in the kitchens when in traditional indian uh, kitchens when we are making rotis and chapatis so when we uh, press the dough down belna jo kehte hain so when we do that there uh, that activity can worsen it uh so try to identify one specific activity which is actually causing the pain to aggravate and try to avoid that um uh, after that uh, you can try lots of uh, rest ice compression and elevation the usual things um we have commercially available tennis elbow braces which uh, support the muscles which goes over the upper part of the forearm not where it exactly hurts but a bit lower down and uh, Uh, over the counter medications uh, you can get these at any pharmacies but please don't uh, uh, take them without medical supervision uh, acyclofenac paracetamol so painkillers and anti-inflammatories usually do the job so majority of the patients get better over the next few weeks with this treatment but uh, some of them they are uh, persistent and they need to come see us we can offer them injections of steroid into the into the inflamed region these are very safe uh, usually most of them get better with this and very very rarely if you are an athletic person it might need surgery to repair uh, the tear and get rid of the inflammation and to summarize like majority of the tennis elbow we see in more in non sports personalities than sports personalities a sports person having a tennis elbow you recommend to go with the non operative measures first like as you said uh, applying ice and all those a splint is very useful how do you uh, tell your patients uh, where to wear the splint because i do see some patients who can i mean uh, unfortunately wear in a different way what is the best way of using the splints and how do you use the splint uh, there are lots of uh, commercially available splints available Uh, there are different makes and models there's no uniformity of uh, the form in which they are customized but the principle but is the principle is that you apply it over the forearm over the muscle belly so the tennis elbow pain will be around the bony prominence of the elbow that is not that is not where you put on the brace it has to be a couple of finger breadths below that over the muscular most muscular part of your forearm uh, certainly yeah. the what it does is when you are placing it below there mm. the area where the muscle tissues is pulled probably that is rested that is how you get the pain relief so you are moving the area of pain or giving rest to the area of pain and you are making the lower area of the muscle to do the work so this bit of the tissue is rested correct that is the main principle of why we use the tennis elbow absolutely so yeah good that's a great answer and um, we have another question uh, i think we already answered this question this is an interesting question uh, it can be for both of us is it must to see a doctor all sports injuries or any solution you suggest hmm that's a bit vague so i mean see uh, as we said in our uh, discussion majority of the sports injuries are muscle tears which can be self cared most majority of them some of the ligament tears particularly around the ankle or the elbow or shoulder can be taken care of by general principles but there are some injuries where you definitely needs to see a sports surgeon particularly the for example in the shoulder rotator cuff tears they need a specialist the shoulder dislocation or labral tears they need a specialist surgeon particularly it is better 
to go to a specially trained shoulder surgeon or a dedicated shoulder surgeon than going to a generalist because the outcomes are better especially for the sports or even the non-sports personalities when it is treated by a dedicated uh, specialist. Similarly in the elbow as we discussed elbow dislocations are not uncommon we can see those as well if that is a severity of the injury you can get back to you need to see a surgeon but if it is a tennis elbow you can try the non op measures which we discussed if that is not helping please see a surgeon in the lower limb like majority of the ankle sprains can be treated by self care you can use a splint and follow the price principle when it comes to the injuries which are making your joint unstable where you are not feeling comfortable certainly get back to the surgeons or to a healthcare facility similarly here also just as said in upper limb you have to seek a, a specialist in that particular area like uh, somebody like me who is specialized in lower limb sports injuries so that gives you a better outcome I hope that will answer your question. So you need to be able to assess the severity of the injury first. If you are able to perform your day-to-day -day activities without much benefit, you can take self-care. But if you are not able to do your day-to-day -day activities, which is uh, impeding because of the pain or the instability, please get back to the healthcare facility. Correct. Can I add a, uh, one or point, yeah, please. Uh, a couple of points? Feel free. So like Srinivas, you already mentioned, at the time of the injury, when you start having the pain, uh, if you have any doubt whether it is either a fracture or a dislocation, if the limb looks out of shape, if the shoulder looks out of place, that time, don't wait on it. Just go to the nearest hospital or a nearest specialist and get it, get it checked out. If you are able to continue with your day-to-day -day activities, continue, uh, maybe for a few days to weeks, but here again the results of treating them early are a lot better rather than waiting for a few weeks and months and then treating them so acute injuries the sooner you come to a specialist after the injury we have more options to give you and we can give you better results whether it is uh, just a protective gear like a walking boot or whether it is an injection or whatever it is uh, so earlier you treat the injury, the results are better. But the more you wait it out, the more delayed, the results obviously will be not as good. Yeah. That's, right. That's a great answer. So another question for you, Harshad. Um, what are the most common shoulder injuries affecting athletes in throwing sports? It's a very specific question and very a very good, very good question Fantastic. for a shoulder surgeon like you. Okay. So uh, exactly, that's a great question. Uh, Throwing involves a lot of torque on the shoulder. There is a lot of stress and strain and shearing forces involved in the shoulder joint. So not only is the shoulder moving, but it also has to generate that power to throw the ball, whether you're bowling or whether you're fielding or any other throwing athlete, it needs to generate a lot of power. So uh, uh, the trick is to try to prevent these injuries by having good muscle strength by having good flexibility of your shoulder, by doing proper stretching, warm-ups before and uh, cool down and stretching after your training session. But if you have any pain, then come see a specialist because there are a couple of conditions which are common in the throwing athlete. One is the slap tear, which is a tear. It, it's technically called superior labrum anterior to posterior tear, too technical, I'm sorry. Uh, but it is a tear of the ring of cartilage, which deepens the socket of the shoulder, of shoulder joint. Uh, the reason it tears is one of the powerful muscles on the front of the arm, the biceps, it is attached to this ring oh. of cartilage. So it's very easy to tear this. Uh, the other important uh, injury a throwing athlete can have is a tear of the rotator cuff. So this is a cuff, uh, this is a group of muscles which bring the ball into the socket and they have to give strength and stability to the shoulder joint in all positions, whether it is by the side of your chest, whether it is whether your elbow is at the level of your shoulder or whether you are actually uh, whether your arm actually goes above the level of your shoulder. So it is critical to shoulder function and it is not uncommon for the cuff to fail, uh, whether it is a minor inflammation or swelling of the cuff or whether it is uh, uh, a frank tear. 
there are also some ligaments which can get injured there are lots of ligaments and they've got funny names i'll not get into the technical stuff uh, but uh, the hegel lesions uh, lots of ligaments can also get uh, injured in throwing athletes okay. thanks for the answer uh, harshad um mr bharat has asked a good question um we have some knee caps with metal sheet support on sides in these knee caps uh, are they suggested for badminton on wooden court um thanks for asking that question bharat um the knee caps with the side supports they are mainly for giving stability of the knee that will limit the movement of the knee significantly and when you are playing any racket sport with the uh, supports on either side which are making your knee rigid that itself can make you uh, prone to injury i wouldn't suggest you to get on when you need to wear a leg a knee immobilizer with side supports it is better to take a specialist opinion before you can get to sport and i wouldn't suggest to use the immobilizer which has side straps which limits the movement so better to avoid that i hope that answers your question um I have a question from uh, mr venugopal um for you sir harshad rotator cuff tears does physical therapy help in them uh, it depends on the age of the patient so age is critical whether it was preceded by an injury that is also critical uh so usually i'm assuming you're a young athlete um, if you're a young athlete or or even a, a recreational player if the rotator cuff tear happens after an injury if you can recall an injury when you were trying to smash uh, the shuttlecock or the ball or whether you were doing any strenuous activity and then suddenly after an injury if the rotator cuff tears then usually they do well with surgery on the opposite side of the spectrum if you are a middle aged or an elderly person then rotator cuff tears can happen without injury as well so these are known as degenerative cuff tears degenerative rotator cuff tears so studies have shown that by the age of 60 a lot of asymptomatic individuals that means people who do not have any uh, shoulder problems or pain they just got 100 of them and got scanning done of the shoulder and they found that out of 100 people at the age of 60 around 25 to 30 people had degenerative cuff tears without any problems they just were able to manage without any sort of a problem in spite of having a cuff tear and when they took 70 years old when they took 100 people who were aged 70 without any shoulder problems and they checked the rotator cuff it was almost 50 to 60% of them who had rotator cuff tears and they were managing absolutely well without any problems so they these elderly people with degenerative cuff tears they usually do not need any treatment so it depends physical therapy has a role to play but it depends where you are on the spectrum so younger people they do well with younger people with traumatic rotator cuff tears they do well with surgery followed by physiotherapy and the older you are or whether it is a degenerative tear then usually physiotherapy is the only answer it might need to be supplemented with a steroid injection or a, a local anesthetic and steroid injection into the shoulder Um, but again these are just general rules it is individualized to each patient absolutely so i think that is where is the key is right individualizing or specific to the patient needs as a specialist that is the role of uh, role we play absolutely we can understand the patient better and there are patient groups who can get better with therapy lot of them do need physical therapy but there are special group of patients who need surgery and post surgery also physiotherapy is very important it's key yeah. it is the key for success of the uh, surgery in rotator cuff tears or for instance acl tears or repairs around the knee joint so yes physical therapy has a key role to play we should not be ignoring sometimes my patients come back and say can i watch this video mm-hmm. on youtube and can i do 
my own therapy. Unfortunately, um, I don't think that is a great idea. I, I know during the lockdown period, yes, we are limited and you have to follow that. But post lockdown, it is very important to uh, do the therapy, especially in the initial periods, under supervision. That way, you will activate the muscle groups which are very important to maintain the joint function. The trick movements will happen without our uh, knowledge, especially those who are not trained to identify the trick movements. Once you start doing the trick movements, you can end up with the chronic problems. That's where it is important that you do the therapy with the therapist supervision so that you can do the right exercises. So another interesting question, uh, I think it's for me. Um, uh, Pranavi, she's asking, uh, can you please suggest some good exercises for the flat foot? Is anything to be worried with the flat foot? That's a great question. Flat foot is a very common normal variant. I'm saying it is a normal variant because there are number of people who can have a flat foot throughout their life and they can have a normal life. But some, some patient group can develop problems with the flat foot, particularly those whose foot becomes a bit rigid or where the muscle balance is not right. These are the group of patients or people who can have problems with the flat foot. The simple exercises you can do to improve the um, flat foot is to go up on the toes, a single toe rise or a double toe rise. But if your flat foot is causing any discomfort, it is better to see a doctor and then be assessed and then you do the appropriate treatment rather than uh, doing it as a blanket therapy. So any flat foot causing any symptoms, better you get assessed and then do the therapy accordingly. Uh, the next question is uh, interesting, we are getting alternate questions. Or Mr. Hari Prasad asked this question, for shoulder dislocation treatment, do you suggest anesthesia for the dislocation? I, I think he probably means in the acute dislocation. Acute dislocations, yeah. Um, uh, by anesthesia, yes, it, it is a very painful condition. Uh, an acute dislocation or the first dislocation that somebody has, it is extremely painful. And it is made worse by the fact that all the muscles surrounding the shoulder, they are in tremendous spasm. So the body nature is trying to prevent any sort of movement in the dislocated joint. So without anesthesia, without any sort of uh, drug which relaxes the shoulder muscles, which takes away the pain, the dislocation, uh, trying attempts at reducing the dislocation, that means trying to get the shoulder back into the joint, are very very risky. If the muscles continue to be in spasm, that means without any sort of anesthesia, the, we can tear off the soft tissues, uh, the labrum, the rotator cuff, uh, maybe even it can cause fractures when we are trying to fight the muscles and put the shoulder back in. So preferably some form of anesthesia should be given. It doesn't have to be a formal full anesthesia in the operation theatre but at least some sort of sedation and muscle relaxation uh, in the a &E, in the emergency room can be given, it has to be given uh, to reduce the first dislocation. Yeah, I think I agree with that in the first dislocation in somebody who is uh, very muscular but how about the elderly who are frail who got a dislocation, we do see them, um, do, you do it uh, still with under anesthesia or you want to give it a try? Um, uh, I, I personally, uh, answering your question, if it's my grandmother who's had this dislocation, yeah. I'd want her to be pain free. So I'll actually give some painkiller, some sedation in the ER uh, to make her at least drowsy and take the edge of the pain. And then yeah, I mean, the, that's a really important question, I mean, the message we need to give out. Um, especially the elderly, without anesthesia, the risk of fractures or more. Hard and uh, we should not be doing something uh, which can be more painful. So avoid uh, trying to manipulate their dislocated shoulder um, without the anesthesia. Better always to do under a 
uh, anesthetic because it is less painful the muscles are relaxed and easy to reduce correct the other thing is in a recurrent dislocation what do you say if the patient has a recurrent dislocation are you happy for the dislocation to be reduced without anesthesia no. like if it happens in a field do oh. you suggest them somebody to try so usually it uh, depends on a lot of factors so i've i've uh, i've seen a lot of patients who are a hundred percent sure that they have dislocated their shoulder and they manage to get it back it all depends on a lot of things so if the first time dislocation if it causes a lot of bony changes if it causes uh, an impaction fracture of the uh, ball of the shoulder joint or if it tears off the soft tissues which are stabilizing the shoulder in the front of the joint so if these occur then it can make reducing self reducing the dislocation quite tricky yeah. so of course by all means try to do it but be gentle so if be it safe. Happens, be safe be, be safe, safe. And uh, you have to understand what is the problem or the person who want to reduce it should have done it before. Yeah. Yes, that absolutely. That makes sense, right? Absolutely. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, a question from Shyam Gunda. Um, you have talked about starting moderate and gradually increasing intensity when you get back post-lockdown. Can we relate to that in terms of heart rate? Uh, that's a great question, Shyam. Yes, certainly you have to uh, understand that with every activity we do, our resting heart rate will go up. The reason why we do warm up to start with before starting any activity is to improve your base level of heart rate to a higher rate so that the tissues which are getting active get adequate oxygen, the good blood pumping into the tissues. So yes, absolutely, but in Every age has certain limit of heart rate where it can go. So you've got to be careful. If you're feeling really um, very fast heart beating, like palpitations, it is causing any discomfort, certainly you have to reduce your intensity act activity. The key is listen to your body. You have to learn how to listen to your body. If you're listening to your body, your risk of having injuries are very less. Okay. Uh, the next question, um, Hello Prasad. Uh, Prasad asked, uh, hey, Sir, when do you recommend to you wear braces in knee injuries? How good braces will help in ligament injury and how fast recovery will be? Thanks for the question Prasad. Certainly um, we have gone through that in the previous uh, talk. I would reassess. Um, uh, the braces in the knee injuries depends upon what type of injury you have. Is it the ligament tear? Is it a injury to the meniscus or if it is a ligament tear, is it the severe tear or a partial tear or a stretch of the ligament? So depending on the severity, we would uh, advise the brace usage. If it is a simple stretch or sprain where the patient is able to walk without any discomfort, but only on activity he is getting pain, I don't think we need to use the braces. They can get on with that. But if the patient has difficulty in doing the day-to-day -day activities or even taking few steps, then certainly we will suggest to use braces. Majority of the ligament injuries, particularly the medial collateral or MCL tear around the knee or LCL tear, which is less common, uh, they uh, heal up in three to six weeks. Usually by six weeks time, you can get back to majority of the sports. But ACL tear, if you have an ACL tear and it is symptomatic, like the knee is unstable, it is causing you pain and giving way, then certainly you need to have good physiotherapy. The physiotherapy to balance the muscle, to get the swelling down, to get your movements improved. And then after a period, say four to six weeks, you reassess. There are two schools of opinion when it comes to ACL tear. Some, one school says uh, go early and fix or do the surgery in patients who need a surgery. But the other school says wait for some time, let the tissue seal, let us reassess is the patient symptomatic with the ACL tear or not. I think I'm a second school guy. I want to reassess, give the conservative treatment first and see how much the patient's function is at a later stage when the pain is reduced, when the swelling has gone down and when the movements have come back. Then you take a call. 
If the patient is still symptomatic, then you say you may need a surgery. If they are able to manage, then you put through them through a therapy, physiotherapy protocol. There are various th physiotherapy protocols for non-operative or post-operative ACL tears. You can go through a specific protocol to improve the function, which is certainly specified to your requirement. Exactly, they are individualized. You have to individualize. That's where the specialist opinion is much better. So try to get to your sports surgeon if you need any further management. Uh, can I continue on that? Uh, one more leading question. How long do you suggest that patients try with the conservative treatment? So you said the second school of thought, we can wait before jumping in surgery. So how long do you wait? Because as per my understanding, if you leave uh, the ACL tears for too long, they can cause further damage to the menisci, they can cause locking of the knee, uh, further damage basically. So how long do you wait generally? Usually, it takes around 6 to 12 weeks, that means 1 and a half to 3 months mm. before the tissues all settle down. So as a ballpark figure, I would say 6 weeks. 6 weeks. At 6 weeks time after the injury, you reassess. If your pain is getting worse or if your swelling is not improving, if you have frequent instability, then you see the surgeon early on. Otherwise, after six weeks, you need a reassessment and then you can take a call whether to proceed with the non-operative treatment or operative treatment when it comes to the ACL tear. Great. So, I have another question. Uh, Uma Namani is asking, could you please explain a bit about the reasons of swelling in lower limbs, calf to feet area, even when there is no injuries? Are there any exercises to avoid the pain and reduce swelling? Mm. It's a generalized question. General question. And uh, it is a very common question or problem we do see. Um, here we have to understand the reason why you are getting swelling in the legs and the pain. In a common generalized scenario, majority of the times it could be uh, because of uh, dehydration, it could be because of lack of strength in the legs, especially the pain, of pain, pain, pain part or it could be because of any un unseen injury which, could, which has happened. So if you have this problem for a longer period, definitely it is important to, for you get, to get assessed, to know the cause for this. Without knowing the cause, it is very difficult to treat. If it is a long-standing problem, yes, you definitely need to see a physician or a surgeon to understand the problem. A general physician would be very useful in this context rather than Absolutely. a sports surgeon. A general physician can look uh, the general causes. It can be because of uh, fluid overload or it can be because of any infections around the uh, in the lower limbs or because of the blood vessel, blood circulation problems. So there are a whole lot of things we need to consider uh, before we can say this is what you need to do. But in general the things you can do is Elevation of the legs is very useful to reduce the swelling in the lower limbs, particularly above the heart level. Number two, keep doing the exercises to stretch your muscles, to strengthen your muscles. Number three, avoid dehydration. Keep drinking plenty of fluids. In summer, it is a very common problem and to prevent that, yes, you need to make sure that you are hydrated well. So these are the general things you can do. If it is still persistent, Please see a physician. Um, Mr. Raj Mohan, um, he's a well known uh, uh, physiotherapist who, uh, from Varangal. Uh, hi, Raj Mohan. So, thanks for the question. Um, a patient is 74 years, unable to do range of movement activities, spe uh, specifically over shoulder joint. Is there any recovery changes without surgery? Because patient having multiple problems like cardiac pacemaker. So as I understand, this 75-year-old patient has difficulty with um, range of movement activities around the shoulder. And uh, she also has multiple comorbidities. So what would you advise to them? Oh, of course. I mean, the main priority in this patient is to get relief from the pain, give her her movement back and as much as possible try to avoid any sort of surgery and anesthesia on her. That is key because we don't want to worsen the problems with her pacemakers and she's elderly. 
So based on the information that uh, I have, she seems to be suffering from a frozen shoulder. So it is usually, uh, it is also known as adhesive capsulitis. It is very common in diabetics. It is very common in people who have uh, heart ailments, whether it is a pacemaker or even a simple stroke, even a simple cardiac arrest, which is recovering can cause uh, frozen shoulder. So in this specific elderly lady with a lot of comorbid conditions, I will suggest a lot of over-the-counter simple painkillers, maybe like paracetamol, and along with that, good physiotherapy. So in the physiotherapy, there are different techniques. You can gently try active assisted movements first to try to get the range of movement back. And as the movement improves to get rid of the pain, we can try to step it up by adding some more resisted exercises. If she is not successful, if she is not happy with the, these two measures, then we can consider a little bit of further imaging. We will need an X-ray to make sure that there is no other problem like for example arthritis of the shoulder is very common in this age group so a simple x-ray might do the job or sometimes we might need to get further imaging and of course MRI will not be possible in her maybe an ultrasound scan of the shoulder to check for any uh, soft tissue injury around the shoulder so here at AIG we have started what is known as uh, ultrasound guided targeted injections so by this method, an ultrasound machine, which is very, very safe, we use, we use it in pregnant women as well. So the same ultrasound is used to assess the shoulder joint, the soft tissues around the sh shoulder joint. And in cases with uh, difficult adhesive capsulitis, we give uh, what is known as a targeted injection. So the needle is accurately placed within the shoulder joint, in the glenohumeral joint, the joint of the ball and the socket of the shoulder. And at that specific place, a cocktail of a small tiny dose of steroid and anesthetic and saline is injected into the shoulder. So what this does is, this not only uh, uh, reduces the swelling there, the local anesthetic and the steroid reduces the inflammation within the shoulder joint, but also the saline, it sorts of stretches the capsule of the shoulder joint. Uh, it's something like blowing a balloon. So once the shoulder joint uh, capsule, the covering of the shoulder joint is stretched out and the inflammation is decreased, then uh, our, our data shows that the, there is a lot of improvement in the pain and along with that, the movements are also increased. Uh, so uh, sometimes, occasionally, uh, as is common in the society, these injections can be given without the ultrasound as, as well. Uh, but you have to realize that these are blind. I, I myself give a lot of these injections without the ultrasound, uh, but they are not as accurate. So ultrasound gives us the added benefit of accurately Accuracy. giving the uh, giving the medicine where it is needed. So injections, yes, I'll definitely recommend injections for this lady. But uh, after a proper evaluation, we have to rule out certain other conditions uh, like arthritis before yeah. we go for this. Yeah. So I hope you got the answer. Um, so certainly. To summarize, first we have to identify the cause by examination and if required imaging. Then treatment wise, try simple painkillers. If that's not working, a targeted. So you want you have you don't want to give a take a second chance with this patient. You want to give a perfect one one uh, shot solution. Exactly. And this could be uh, as uh, Dr. Hasha said, ultrasound guided injection into the shoulder as which will make a big difference. Um, go to another question. Uh, I think we have running out of time. We'll try and answer these couple of questions before we conclude. Uh, this again, a generalized question. Sir, does every, uh, Mr. Arram Malikarjun has asked this question. Does every grade of tear need surgery for athletes to improve their performance? Mm. That's a fantastic question. Exactly, it, it sort of covers the entire spectrum of tears. So the priority in athletes, uh, uh, let me go first, then you can follow up. So uh, uh, the priority in athletes is to get them back onto, the, onto their career path as quickly as possible. Any time off that they have, 
uh, is detrimental because they have reasonably short career spans. It's not as if they can continue sports well after 40s or 50s. So when they are at their peak, we want to give them the treatment which will make them pain free, which will help them return to their uh, pre-injury level of performance as, uh, as quickly as nature, as quickly as biology permits. So in my opinion, if uh, for example uh, an athlete with a rotator cuff tear, he comes to me, I will straight away go for surgery because the results of surgery are a lot more predictable. So I can give him an expected time frame, say after such and such months, you can go back to your training. Whereas in conservative treatment, the, the time frame are not so clear, the treatment results are not so predictable. So I tend to be a little bit more uh, surgically oriented in athletes with frank, uh, frank injuries. How about yourself, Srinivas? Certainly, as uh, you said, it depends upon the patient. You have to cater the patient, identifying the right patient. Not every patient needs surgery. There are specific group of patients who definitely benefit from surgery. Um, similarly, when it comes to the lower limb sprains, majority of the ankle ligament tears, they doesn't need surgery. If it is a grade 3 injury which is causing real instability of the joint in an athlete, yes, certainly that needs uh, surgery. But if it is a grade 1 or 2, majority of the times we don't have to do surgery. When it comes to knee joint, again, if it is a multi-ligament injury which is causing instability, definitely surgery, immediately. But if it is a isolated ACL tear, depending on the patient, if we individualize. So it is very important to assess the problem, taking the patient as a whole, and then give the solution. Majority of the times, these tears can be treated non-operatively, but some of them will definitely have good benefit from surgery when we do it early on. So there's another question from Sham. Um, he plays badminton regularly and on and off he gets knee pain. Um, should I be concerned and need to see a doctor when I feel pain again next time? Um, certainly, Sham. If you are having uh, intermittent pain which is getting gradually worse, certainly you need to see a doctor to assess what is the cause of the pain. Majority of the times it can be because of uh, uh, inst uh, uh, imbalance in the muscle groups working around the knee joint or sometimes there may be a meniscal tears or any ligaments involved. You may need a definitive uh, assessment by a sports surgeon if your problem is recurring again. I think we'll close with another question. Uh, this is uh, for Harshad uh, from Chitradeka. Um, hi Harshad sir, nice to see you here. My question is how to get relief from tennis elbow? Ravi is suffering from this, he feel pain storm shoulder to fingers. This is a very specific question for you, Harsha. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Ravi is suffering from? Uh, tennis elbow. Okay. And uh, he feel pain storms, pains from the shoulder to the fingers. Okay. All right. Hi, Chitralekha. Uh, nice to hear from you too. Hope you're all right. Um, so it's a bit tricky. So if you're very, very sure it's a tennis elbow, then we've already specified the treatment, uh, which is uh, rest, activity modification, icing, tennis elbow brace. Uh, one of our previous scholars, he asked a similar question. We have answered that. Uh, but uh, Ravi, you said, has pain radiating, I mean, extending from the shoulder to the fingers. So that is not very common in tennis elbow. Tennis elbow pain is usually around the elbow, on the outer aspect of the elbow joint. A similar condition like tennis elbow, it is known as golfer's elbow. The pain can occur on the inside of the elbow joint. And they are triggered by very, very specific activities uh, which involve this movement. So lifting weights or uh, resisted dorsiflexion. That means when you try to hold your uh, wrist joint in this position and try to pull your hand up, they causes terrible pain. This reproduces the pain. Pain which, uh, this is classical of tennis elbow or the golfer's elbow. But if the pain is coming from the shoulder and going down to the fingers, there are some other conditions which are completely different from a tennis elbow, which we have to evaluate for. 
So there are lots of causes why the pain can travel from the shoulder or sometimes even from the base of the neck, the back of the shoulder, the side of the arm and then they can go down to the fingers. Usually it is because of pinching of one of the nerves. So there are three nerves that go to the hand and if one of the nerves is getting pinched in the neck, it can usually cause such symptoms. So uh, before labeling this pain as coming from tennis elbow, I think it's reasonable for uh, you to visit a specialist or a doctor and then make sure that it is tennis elbow uh, because uh, we don't want these changes to become long term. Once they become long term, it's very difficult to get rid of the problem. So timely intervention, timely diagnosis, identifying the cause of the pain is key. So specifically in this, with the limited information that I have, I'd like to evaluate his neck as well. So usually it's very common because of some minor muscle imbalances or maybe in severe cases because of uh, a slip disc, nerves can get pinched which can cause pain right down the entire arm. I completely agree with you Dr. Hasher. As a rule of thumb, it is very important to identify the source of pain. First of all, that is very important, identify the source of pain and the second thing, we need to localize what is that and what measures we can take and how we can help. So um, I completely agree with Dr. Harshad. Uh, Ravi definitely needs a proper assessment and then we can get what, what exactly we can treat, how well we can treat him. With this, uh, thank you all the viewers for joining us. I hope uh, you had a uh, information on how we can return back to sports after lockdown and prevent injuries. We urge you guys to be safe at home or when you're out after the lockdown mm -hmm. and take all the precautions. We still don't have a treatment for Corona yet and it is uh, very evident that self-discipline is the key in preventing the problem. Please use the mask, maintain the social dis distance and also self-care. And please use the sanitizers. So, thank you once again. We'll say cheers from AG Hospitals, Department of Orthopedics. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you so much. If you need any further information, uh, you can reach to us on our email. We are more than happy to get back to you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye.